Homer, the Iliad, translated by Robert Packles, introduction and notes by the Bernard Knox. Penguin Classics, the Iliad. The Greek believed that the Iliad and the Odysseus were composed by a single poet whom they named Homer. Nothing is known of his life, while seven Greek cities claim the honor of being his birthplace. Ancient traditions place him in Ionia, located in eastern Aegean. His birth date is undocumented as well. Though most modern scholars now place the composition of the Iliad and the Odysseus in the late 8th or early 7th century BC, Robert Fagels is author. Is author W. Marx, nineteen professor of comparative literature, emeritus at Princeton University. He is a recipient of the 1997 Penn Dwarf Mannheim Medal for Translation and the 1996 Academy Award in Literature from American Academy of Arts Letters. Fagels has been elected to the Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Science. An American Philosophical Society, he has translated the poem of Becky Lights, the translations of Occult's Three Thebans plays as a childless or a nominated for National Books Awards and Homer's Iliad winners of the 1991 Harlow Morton Lantern Translation Awards by the Academy of, of America Poets an award from Translation Center, the Academy of American Poets, an award from the Translation Center of Columbia University, and New Jersey Humanity Books Awards are published in Penguin Classics. His original poetry and his translation have appeared in many journals and reviews, as well as in his books of poems. Vincent's poem from the picture of Van Gogh his Stofagels was one of the associate editor of Maynard Max Twig and Ham edition of Alexander Pope's Iliads and Odysseus and the George Steiner edited Homer, a collection of critical essays. Mr. Fagel's most recent work is a translation of Homer Odysseus available for Penguin. Bernard Knox is a director of Emeritus of Harvard Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, D.C. His essay and review have appeared in numerous publications. Only in 1978, he won the George Jean Nathan Award for Dramatic Criticisms. His works include Oedipus at the Theba, Sophocles, Tragic Hero, and His Time. The Heroic Tempest Studies in Sophocles, Tragedies, Words, and Actions, Essays on the Ancient Theater, Essay Ancient Modern. Awards the 1989 Pen Spiel Vogel Der Mustein Awards, the oldest dead world white European males and other reflection on the classics and back, backing into the future, the classical tradition and its renewal. Mr. Knox is the editor of the Norton Books of Classical Literature and has also collaborated with Robert Fagels on the Odysseys and the Three Tribune Plays. Penguin Books Publications Penguin Books Publications Present Home Homer The Iliad Robert Fagels had done the translation, Bernard Knox had given a notes and introduction. To the memory of my father and my mother, and for Lynn, Katya, and Nana, Nina, Humus Kathy Este, Priste Te Este Te Panta, Hemis Te Clois Oyan, Op Oman Ode Te Idman. Translator's preface, Homer make us hero, Pope has said, 
and Virgilius readers. So the great translator of Homer, no doubt unknowingly, set at odd the claims of an old tradition and those of a literary one as well. We would call the true tradition now. Homer works is a performance even in a part of musical events, whereas that is the source of his speed, directness and simplicity that Matthew Arnold heard and his nobility too elusive yet undeniable that Arnold chased but never really caught. Surely it is a major source of Homer's energy, lofty and carry of his imaginations that sweep along the listeners together with the performance. For there is something powerful in his songs, that unequalled fire and rapture, Pope again, which is so forcible in Homer that no man of a true poetical spirit is master of himself. Why experience the Iliad in Homer and in him only it turn, it burns everywhere, clearly and everywhere irres- irresistibly. But it also brings to light the Homeric question facing all translator, how to convey the power of his performance in a medium of writing. Homer makes us hearer and Virgil may leave us reader. Yet the contrast may be too extreme. Virgil, the writer, was certainly no stranger to recitation. Homer, the performer, as introduction speculates, may have known a rudimentary form of writing, and writing may have lent his work some qualities we associate with texts in general. Idiosyncrasis at time and pungency and wit, and with the Iliads is in particular its archaeo architectonics, its magnificent scales and figure of Achilles. But even if Homer never used an alphabet himself, the now seems less the creature of an oral tradition, whom Millman Perry discovered and more and more its master, as envisioned by Paris and Adams. Homer, the brilliant improvisers, deployed a stock inherited feature with all the individual talent he could muster, never more so in a fact than in his use of the fixed and formulaic, frequently repetitive phrase. Not only is Homer often less formulaic, but the formulas themselves are often more resonates, more apt and telling in their context that the heart Paritus had argued for at the first, so original form of Homer work, while a far cry from a work of literature as we know it now, it is not exactly a song either pure and simple. It may be the more records of a song building over the poet lifetime, perhaps, or whatever may an animal would call a similar crum of spontaneity. Obviously, at a far remove from Homer, in this translation, I had tried to find a middle ground and not a no man land, if I can help it, between the feature of his performance and the expectations of a contemporary reader, not a line for a line translation. My version of the Iliad is, I hope neither so literal in rendering Homer's language as to cramp and distort my own, though I want to convey as much of what he says as possible, nor so literally as to break his energy, his forward drives, though I want my work to be literate with any luck, for the more literal approach will seem to be too little English and more literal seems too little Greek. I have tried to find a cross between the two, a modern English Homer. Of course, it is a risky business stating what one has tried to do or worse, the principle of one has used petards that will probably hoist the writer later. But the words or two of explanation seem in order and the first refer to the more fixed and formal like parts of Homer. I have treated them in flexible, discretionary way, not incompatible with Homer way. I think especially when his formula are functional as well as fixed, while also answering to the way we read today, it is matter of riding easy in harness.
riding easy in the harness. As Robert Frost once said of democracy, and my practice ranges from the plain to the street with one of the most frequently repeated phrases, for example, the line that introduced individual speeches, I have been the freest, trying to anticipate the speaker nuance of the movement yet retaining at least the ritual of the introductory words for every speech when homer introduction a speech introduce a speech of wings were however i rarely if ever omit that well-known phrases though i like the flight of the words to vary with a quick burst at them and a longer drift at others according to what a character has to say and so with hector's flashing helmets in the epithet that clinched to hector name i like to ally its gleaming with his action now nodding his head in conversation now rushing head alongs into the front lines but the flashing helmet it is again and again and not only to make his own career appear more metro meteoric and abruptly snuffle out but also to support a chain of tragic ironies throughout the poem for the flashing helmets hector's own at first his own replaced by the one he is free from petroclus when he kills him the helmet of achilles so as prophecy would have it when achilles destroy hector in revenge he must destroy himself as well his flashing mirror image embroidered in his victim and the helmet he will wear fire new and forged by hephaestus flashes like the helmet of ares when achilles close for the kill book 20.45 22.158 The more the epithet recurs, in short, the more its power can recoil, and the inevitably lity of its recoil for Hector is further stressed by a repeated repetition in the Greek repeated verbatism. In the English version, the words that describe the death of Patroclus are exactly those that describe the death of Hector six books later. 16.1001 dash five twenty two point four two five dash twenty nine the first death both in the mind of achilles the avenger and in the style of his maker will have served as warrant for the second all in all then i had tried for the repetition with a difference when variation seems useful repetition with a grim insistence when the scales of zeus the homeric moral balance is at issue turning briefly to homer's metrics so we Though my way is more remote, it is also meant to occupy a flexible middle ground. Here, between the hexameter, like his ear, ear for the sea surge, as Pound described it, and a tighter native English line, if, as the introduction claims, the strongest weapon in Homer's poetic arsenal is variety within metrical norms, the transition opts for the free give and the take between the two and one that offer a good deal more variety than uniformity working from a loose five or six beat line but inclining more to six i expand at some time to seven beats to imply the big bridge of simile or some vehement or outburst in discourse or the pitch fury by combat on the field or contract a time to three to give a point in speech or action sharpest rest such interplay between the variety and norms results i suppose from a kind of talk of war peculiar to translation between trying to encapsulate the meaning of the greek on the one hand and trying to find a cadence for one english on the other yet joining hand if possible to make a line of verse i hope it result at any rate not only in giving my own language a slight stretching it may need and sometimes guess this is but also in lending homer the sort of range in rhythms pace and tone that may make an idiot engage it to a modern reader it may be a way as well again at a far remo of trying to suggest the tension in homer's metric his blend of mass and movements bore so much on course yet so much grace and speed 
In aiming for this and other objectives in versions of the Iliad, I have had many kinds of help. The greatest has come from my collaborators, Bernard Knox, whom I would rather call a comrade. Not only he has written the introduction notes to the transaction, translation, but he has commented on my draft for several years. Here and throughout the volume, except for the list of textual variant on page number 619, line numbers refer to the translation, where the line number of the Greek text will be found at the top of every page. Those pages now, his commentary seems to ring my typescript so completely that I might be looking at a worse form where dog-eared manuscript encircled by socialized remarks or is it something of a battle map as well. The vulnerable line at the center are showed up by combat testers ally whose squads reinforce the weaker sectors and who deciphers Homer's orders of the day and tell a raw recruit what war. The movement of armies and the sentiments of soldiers is all about, and more what tragedy in this, the first tragedy really mean. In Book 9 of the Iliad, all phonics call for a man of words and a man of action too. My good fortune has been to work with such a man. Several modern scholars and critics cited in the biography have helped as well, and so have several modern translators of the Iliad in whole, a part each has introduced me to new aspects of the poem. Another potential for the present, for it is, for if it is true, uh, as man out, Max Papur, uh, what we translate from a given works is what wearing the spectacles of our time. We see in it, it is also true that we see in what we have the power to translate. So my debts to others are considerable and hence I say my thanks to William Arrowsmith, Robert Grace, Martin Hammonds, Richard Mont, Latimer, Christopher Lux, Paul Maison, Ennis Reese and E. B. Ryu. A few I have known in a person and most I have never met, yet I suspect we all have known each other in a way. Having trekked across the same territory perhaps, having all encountered the nightmare that haunted Pope, that he was engaged in a long journey, as Joseph Spence reported, person which way to take and full of tears, that it would never end, and if you reach the end, the fear may start in earnest. In any event, the translator I have known the best is the one whom I owe the most, Robert Fritz, Fritz, Gerald, Fritz, Fritz Gerald, both for the power of his example and because at a sensitive moment he heartened me to fit on your greaves and sword, sword belt and face the moil of the mill or the melee. Many other friends have come on my, to my side, some by reading, some by listening to me read the work in program and responding in close detail with criticism or encouragement or healthy combination of the two. Most criticism or encouragement or the healthy combination of the two, most encouraged of all men has asked me, why another Iliad? For each understood it seems that if Homer was a performer, then his translators might aim to be one as well. And that no two performance of the same work surely not of musical composition so probably not of a work of language either will ever be the same timbers and tempos of each will be distinct let alone its deeper resonance will and trust my thanks then to Marlene Arthur Paul Auster Sandra Bernman Charles B. A. Claudia Brodsky Beth Bromtham Brombert Victor Brombert, Clarence Brown, Rebecca Bushnell, Robert Kenor, Robert F. Cohen, Rachel Hayes, Robert Hollander, Samuel Hines, Edwin Hegele, Nita Craven, Renate Lembecker, David Lenson, William Levithan, Herbert Marks, J.D. McClatchy, Earl Minor, William Mullin, Georgia Nucnet, Joyce Carol Otis, John, John Prince, Michael Putnam, David Quinn, Richard Wright, James Richardson, Charles Segal, Stephen Shankman, Michael Simpson, Raymond Smith, Paula Luante, and Theodore Suisse. 
and several classicists have led a study hands. William A. Char, George Donkey, Elaine Phantom, Andrew Ford, John Kenney, Richard Martin, Glenn Morse, and former Zeit Lenum. The published commentaries of the scholars cited among the further reading and even some unpublished have helped us on our way. Thanks to the kindness and clarity of the author, our books was in its later stage when M. M. Willock sent the galley of his second volume books, 13 to 24, and the remaining part of the commentary in progress under G. S. Craig's editorship, his own works on Book 5 through A. J. B. Hines' words on 9 through 12, Richard Jankos on 13 through 16, Mark, Mark W. Edward on 17 through 20, and Nicholas Richardson on 21 through 24, luckily arrived while each was still in a pro or typescript. The first impulse for the translation, however, came from the late W. B. Stanford, who one afternoon in County Wicklow, many years ago, sketched out my roof for returning to the source. The roof of the some great houses had extended welcome shelter to the translator and his work. Theodore and May Cross have turned Nantucket's in Ithaca West with their Homeric hospitality. The Rockefeller Foundation provided a resident fellowship at the Villa Sabinolin in Spelegoya during May 1984. Prince Stern University gave me leave of absence in the spring a semester in of 1982 and 1989. More important, the chance to study homework with many students who have been an education to me. The program in Hellenic studies at the university twice appointed me to Stanley J. Seeker Fellowship first to begin the translation on Greek terrain, then to complete it the year later. The Secretary of Comparative Literature from its leader, Carol Szymanski, to Gary Fuchs, to Quiet Writer, and lately, Laser Jet have been invaluable in helping to prepare the final manuscript and close to the zero hour. Diobora, Diobro, Bureshreya shared the task of playing the Greek line numbers throughout the text. To produce the book at my hand, my editor Catherine Court, assisted by Caroline White, has treated the writing and the writer too with energy, affection, and address. Bina Kamlani effort to copy edit a very large and unruly manuscript have been hero- heroic, and goal and all her artistry joined by Amy Hills has designed um, a volume to companion the two that came before it. Anita Carl and James Kemp have drawn up the fine maps to guide the reader through the wilds of Homer's world. Madison then has labored long and hard with the Joma Say and Peter Smith to find this version of the Iliad. Some reader and the good people at Viking Penguin, Michael Jacob, Christian Pavel, like Butler, Paul Slovak, Messier Bush, Faye Danner, Maureen Donnelly, Daniel Lundy, Cynthia Eicher, Ronnie Axel Ross, all have been loyal allies in New York. In London, Peter Katzen and Paul Keekens have been generous hosts to the latest Homer in the house. Before he left the publishers, my former editors, Alan William, who saw me through the trouble of Aeschylus and Sophocles, gave me plans a happy push towards Troy. Prior to the present volume, Ben Sonberg graciously opened the pages of Grand Street Volume. Ben Sonberg graciously opened the pages of Grand Street and ran three books of translation. Reginald Gibbon gave another book timely birth in Cry Quarterly and threw it all without the unfailing stay and strategy of my friend and agent George Burr Shardet. Assisted by Cindy Klein, this Iliad might never have been published. The classic, it is the classics, Blake exclaimed with a point reference to Homer. It is the the classic, it is the classics, Blake exclaimed with pointed reference to Homer. That desolate Europe with wars, 
The violence of Iliad can be overpowering as it was for Simon Weil and many others yet as introduction Homer. Observe, Homer made the violence coexist with humanity and compassion as close together as the city at war and the city at peace emblaze, emblazoned on Achilles' shields. Of the, if the translation offers and sense of this, it is because the translator has often consulted the familiar spirit of Adam and Anne Paddy and always relied on the muse someone in the dedication, chief among them Lynn. Robert Fagnett, Princeton, New Jersey, June 17, 1990. A note on the printing. This printing contains minor revision of the text RF and BK. Translator preface, introduction, introduction, spelling and pronunciation of Homeric names, 65, map 1, Homeric geography, main language, 68, 2, Homeric geography, the Peloponnes, 70, 3, Homeric geography, the Aegean and Asia Minor, insert Troy and vicinity, 72, Homer, The Iliad, Book 1, The Rage of Achilles, page number 77. Book 2, The Great Gathering of Armies, page number 99. Book 3, The Heron Review, The Champions, 128. Book 4, The Truths, Arabs in Wars, 145. Books 5, Diomedes Fight the God, 164. Book 6, Hector Return to Troy, 195. Books Ajax, Tools with Hector's 214. Books 8, The Tide of the Battle Turn, 231. Books 9, The Embassy of Achilles, 251. Book 10, Merudim, Through the Night, 276. Book 11, Agam, Agamemnon, Agamemnon, Days of Glory, 296. Book 12, The Trojan Storms and the Ramparts, The Trojan Storms, The Rampart, 325. Book 13, Battling for Ships, 341. Books 14, Hera of Flying Zeus, 369. Book 15, Achaean Armies at Bay, 387. Book 16, Patroclus, Fight and Dice, 412. Book 70, Menelaus, Finest Harbor, 442. Book 18, The Shield of Achilles, 467. Book 19, Champion Arms for Battle, 488. Book 20, Olympian God in Arms, 503. But book 21 Achilles fight the river 520 book 22 the death of Hector 541 book 23 the funeral games for Petroclus 559 book 24 Achilles and Priam 58 notes the genealogy of the royal house of tribe 617 texture variant from the Oxford Classical Text 619, Notes on the Translation 621, Suggestion for Further Reading 635, Pronouncing Clause 3 639, Introductions. Homer's The Iliad. The Iliad, written by Greek poet and author Homer. Book One The Rage of Achilles. Rage goddess seeing the rage of Peleus son Achilles murderous tombs. The cause the Archean countless losses hurling down to the house of death. So many sturdy souls, great fighter soul, but made their bodies carry on. Faith for the dogs and birds and the will of Zeus was moving towards its end. Begin the moose when two when the two first broke and clashed Agamemnon, Lord of Men, and brilliant Achilles. What God drove them to fight with such a fury? Apollo, the son of Zeus, and Leto, incensed at the kings, he swept a fated plague through the army. Men were dying, and all because Agamemnon spawned Apollo's fleet. Yes, Croesus approached the Achillean fast ships to win his daughter back, bringing a priceless ransom.
and bearing high in hand wound on the golden staff the wrath of the god the distant deadly archers he begged the whole achaean army but most of all the two supreme commander atreus two sons agamemnon melenus all agreed gear for war may the god who hold the halls of olympus give you prime city to plunder then safe passage home just set my daughter free my dear one here accept this gift this ransom honor the god who strike from the world away the son of zeus apollo and all ranks of akin cried out the ascent respect the priest accept the shining ransom but it brought no joy to the heart of agamemnon king dismissed the priest with a brutal order ringing in his ear never again old man let me sight of you by the hollow ships not right trains now not slinking back tomorrow the staff and the red of cork will never save you then the girl i will not give up the girl long before that old age will overtake her in my house in our ghosts far from her father lamb slaving back and forth at the loom force to share my bed. now go don't tap my wrap and you may depart alive the old man was terrified he obeyed the order turning trading away in silence down the shores where the battle line of breaker crashed and dragged and moving off to a safe distance over and over the old priest prayed to the son of a sleek haired little lord apollo hear me apollo god of the silver bow who stride the wall of christ and sila sacrosanct lord in the power of thenodius thenodus Sminetus, god of plague if i ever roofed a shrine to please your heart ever burned the long rich bones of bulls goods on your holy altars now now bring my prayer to pass pay the damnus back your arrow for my tears his prayer went up and phobus apollo heard him down he strode from the olympus peak storming at heart with his bow and hooded quiver slung across his shoulder the arrow clanged at his back as a god quaked with rage the god himself on the march down he came like a knight over against the ship he drowned to a knee let fly a shaft and terrifying clash rang out from the great silver bow first he went for the moons and circling dogs but then launching the piercing shaft at the men themselves he cut them down in rows and the corpse fire burned on night and day no end in sight nine day the arrow of god swept through the army on tenth archery scored all ranks to muster the emperor seized him sent by white armed hera giving to see archean fighter drops and die once they gathered crowding the meeting ground the swift runner achilles rose and spoke among them son of atreus now we are beaten back i fear the long camping is lost so home we sail if we can escape over there if war and play are joining force now to crush the argue uh, but wait let us question a holy man a prophet even a man skilled with dreams dream as well can come over away from the source come someone to tell us why apollo rages so whether he blame us for woe we fail or sacrifice if only the god would share the smoky savour of lamps and full grown goats Apollo might be willing still somehow to save us from this plague, so he proposed, and down he sat again as Calchasus rose among them. Tester's son, the clearest by far of all the seers, who scanned the fight of birds, he knew all things that are all the things that are past and all are to come. The seer who had led to a give ship to Troy, with second sight that God Apollo gave him. For the army's goods, the seer begins to speak. Achilles, dear to Zeus, you order me to explain Apollo Angus, the distant deadly archers, I will tell it all. But strike a pact with me, swear you will defend me with all your heart, with words and strength of hand. For there is a man I will enrich, I will see it now, a powerful man who lords it. Over all argues when the archi archians must obey 
A mighty king raging against an inferior is too strong. Even if he can swallow down his wrath today, still he will nurse the burning in his chest. Until sooner or later he send it bursting forth. Consider it closely. Achilles, will you save me? And the matchless runner reassured him. Courage! Out with it now. Calchus, reveal the will of God, whatever you may know. And I swear by Apollo, dear to Zeus, the power you pray to Calchus. When you reveal God will to the argue, no one not while I am alive and see the light on earth. No one will lay his heavy hand on you by the hollow ships, none among all the armies, not even if you mean Agamon here, who now claimed to be by far the best of Archians. The seer took her, and this time he spoke up bravely. Beware, he cast no blame for a wolf. We failed a sacrifice, the god enraged because Agamon and spurned his priest. He refused to free his daughter, he refused the ransom, that's why. Archer sent us pain, and he will send us more, and never drive this shameful destruction from the Argives. Not Till we give back the girl with sparkling eye to her loving father, no price, no ransom paid, and carried a sacred bundle of wolves to Christ's town. Then we can calm the god, and only then appease him. So he declared and sat down, but among them rose the fight. Ding son of Atreus, lord of the far flung kingdom, at Momenon, Agam, non. Furious, his dark heart feels to the brim, blazing with anger now his eye like searing fire. With a sudden killing look, he wields on Calchus first. Seer of misery, never a word that works for to my advantage. All this misery warm your heart, your prophecy. Never a word of prophet said or brought to pass. Now again, now you divine God will for mommy brute at about as a fact why the deadly archers multiply our pains because I refuse that glittering prize for the young girl crisis. Indeed I prefer her by far the girl herself and want her mine in my own home house. I rank her higher than Clit Clytemnestra, my very wife, she nothing less in build or breeding in mind or work of hand, but I am willing to give her back even so. If this is the best for all, what what I really want is to keep me, my people safe, not see them dying. But fetch me another price and straight off too, else I alone of the argues go without my honor. That would be disgrace. You are all witness. Look, my price is snatched away, but the swift of now actually answers him once. Just how Agam, non greater field marshals, most grasping men alive. How can the genders argue give you a price now? I know of no truce or pleasure pile lying either anywhere. Whatever we drag from town, we plunder it all, being portioned out, but collect it, call it back from the ranks and piles. That would be disgrace, so return the girl to the god, at least for now. We Archeans will play you back three, four, or over. If Zeus will grant us the grave somehow, someday, to raise Troy mass will rampart to the ground. But King Agamemnon countered, not so quickly, brave as you are, god like Achilles, trying to cheat me. Oh no, you wouldn't get past me. Take me in the way. What do you want to clinch to your own price? But I said clearly, calmly, by empty handed here, is that why you order me to give her back? No, if our generous argues will give me a price to match for my desire equal to what I lost well and good. But if they give me nothing, I will take a price myself, your own or Atex or Odysseus price. I will commend those who myself and let that man I go to visit choke with rage. Enough we will will deal with all this later in due time. Now come, we haul a black ship's down to the bright sea together, a decent number of oarsmen along her lock and put aboard a sacrifice and crisis herself in all her beauty. We embark her too, let one of the leading captain take command, at six, you the minas, trusty Odysseus, or you, Achilles, you the most violent man alive, so you can perform the righteous for us and calm the god yourself a dark glance. 
and the headstrong runner answered him in kind shameless armor in shamelessness always showed with greed how would any argue soldiers obey your order freely and gladly do your sailing for you or fight your enemies full force now i know it was a trojan spearman who brought me here to fight Trojan never did me damage, not in the least. They never stole my cattle or my horse, never in Phaethia, where the rich soil breeds strong men did. They lay waste my crop. How could they? Look at the endless mile that lies between us. Shadowy mountain fringes, sea that surged and thunder. No, no, you call colossal shameless. We all followed you to please you, to fight for you, to win your honor back from the Trojans. Menelaus and you, you dog face, what you care? Nothing, you don't look right or left, and now you threaten to strip me of my prize in person, the one I fought for long and hard, and son of Archie handed her to me. My honor never equal yours. Whenever we sack some wealthy Trojan stronghold, my arms bear the brunt of the raw savage fighting through, but when it comes to dividing up the plunder, the lion chase is yours, and how I have to I go to my ship clutching some scraps, some pittance that I love when half out to exhaustion. No more now. Back I go to Fithia better that way by war, by far to journey home in the beaked ship of war. I have no mind to linger here, disgrace brimming your cups and piling up your plunder. But the law of men, Agamemnon, short back, desert by all means, if the spirit drive you home, I will never beg you to stay, not to my on my account, never others will take my side and do me honor, Zeus above all, whose wisdom rules the world, you, I hate you most of all, the warlords, loved by the gods, always dear to your hearts, strife, years, and battles, the bloody grind of war, what if you are the great soldier, that just a gift of God? Go home with your ships and comrade lord it over your mighty midons. You are nothing to me, you and your overweening angers, but let this be my warning on you away. Since Apollo insists on taking my crazy, yes, I will send her back in my own ship with my crew, but I, I will be there in person at your tenets to take busy in all her beauty, your own past. So you can learn just how much greater I am than you, and the next man up may shrink from matching word with me, from hoping to rival Agamemnon's strength for strength. He broke off and anguish gripped Achilles. The heart in his rock chest was pounding down. Should he drown the long sharp sword slung at his hips, thrust through the ranks and kill Agamemnon now, or check his rage and beat his fury down? As his racing spirits veered back and forth, just as he drew his hoose blade from its sheets down from the vaulting heavens, swept Athen, Athena, the white armed goddess Hera, spared her down. Hera loved both men and cared for both alike. Raiding behind from palace, seized her fiery hairs. Only Achilles saw her, none of the other fighter, struck with the wonder of her. He spun around. Around he knew her at once, Pallas Athena, the terrible blazing of those eyes, and his wings words <laughs> went flying. Why, why now, child of Zeus and the shield of thunder, why come now to witness the outrage Agamemnon just committed? I tell you this, and so help me, it's the truth. He will soon pay for his arrogance with his wife. He grey eyed, clear. The goddess Athena answered, Down from the sky I come to check your rage. If only you will wield. The white armed goddess Hera sped me down. She loved you both. She cared for you both alike. Stop this fighting now. Don't lay hand to his sword. Lash him with threats of the price that he will face. And I tell you this, and I know this is the truth. One day glittering rift will lie before you, three times over to pay for all his outrage. Hold back no, obey us both, so she urged, and the swift runner compiled at once. I must then I must when the two of you had down commands, goddess or man submit through his heartbreak with fury. Better for him by far if a man obeys the god 
they're quick to hear his prayer and with that Achilles stayed his burly hands on the silver shelves and slid the huge blade back in his sheets. He would not fight the order of Athena. Sovereign homes to Olympus she rejoined the gods, aloof in the hall of Zeus who shared his thunder, where Achilles rounded on Agamemnon once again, slashing out at time, now relaxing his anger for a moment. Struggling drunk with your dog eye, you found out. Never once did you arm um, with the troops and go to battle, risk an ambush packed with archaic and picked men. You lack the courage, you can see death coming, safer by far. You find to foray of all through camps, come during the price of any man who speaks against you, king who devour his king, people worthless, has the men you rule. If not stri- stride, this outrage would have been your last. I will tell you this, I swear, I might all upon it by this, this sceptre's look, that never again will put forth crowns and branches, now le- le- it's left its stumps on the mountain ridges forever, nor will its sprouts new green again, now to the brazen axe has stripped its box and leaves, and now the son of Achaea passes back and forth as they hand the judgment down. Upholding the honors custom whenever Zeus commands, this captors will be the mighty force behind my oath. Some day, I swear, a yearning for Achilles will strike at your sons and your all armies. But then, at right, Harold, as you will be nothing, you do can save you. Not when your holders or fighter drops and die. You cut down by the hand of man, killing Hector. Then. Then you will tear your heart out, a spirit raging that you disgrace the best of Achean. Down on the ground. He sceptres, he dashed the sceptre studded bright with golden nails, then took his seats again. The son of Atreus smoldered, glaring across at him, but Nestor rose between them. The man of winning words, the clear Greek speaker of Pylos, sweetener than honey from his tongue. The voice flowed on and on. Two generations of mortal men he had been so seen go down by now. Those who were born and bred with him in the old days, and the plus holy lamb, Yama, and now he ruled the third. He pleaded with both the kings with clear goodwill. No more ornamental sorrow comes to our care. Now they would exult Priam, Priam's sons, and all tortured, oh, they live for you, to hear the two of you battling on this way. You will excel us all first in Achean council, first in the war of war. Stop, please, listen, listen to Nestor. You are both younger than I. And in my lifetime, I struck up with better men than you. Even you, but never once did they make light of me. I never seen such men. I never will again men like Pirathos, Dryrus, Tadfine, Captain, Cadmus, and Exodus, and Polypmus, Royal Prince, and Pieces, Aegeus, Boys, a match for the immortal. They were the strongest mortal ever bred on earth. The strongest and the four against the strongest too. Shaggy Senatorus, while Brutus of the mountain, they hacked them down, terrible deadly work, and I was in their rank fresh out of Pylos, far away from home. They enlisted me themselves. I fought on my own, a freelance, single handed, and none of the men who walked the earth these days could battle with those fighters, none of but. They, they took to heart my counsels. Mark my words, so now you listen too. Yielding is far better. Don't seize the girl, Agamemnon. Powerful as you are, leave her, just as the son of Achaea gave her his prize from the very first. And you, Achilles, never hope to fight it out with your king, pitting force against his force. No one can match the honor dealt a king. You know Sceptre's kings to whom Grizzwes gives glory, strong as you are. A goddess was your mother. He has more power because he rules more men. At rise in your anger. Look, it's Nestor's. I beg you, cool your fury against Achilles. 
Here the man stands over all Achilles' army, over rugged bulwark, brack, or shock of war. But King Agamemnon answered him in haste, True old man, all you say is fit and proper, but this soldier wants to tower over the armies. He wants to rule over all, to lord it over all, give out order to every man inside. Well, there is one I trust who will never yield to him. What if the everlasting God have made a spear's man of him? Have they entitled him to hurl abuse at me? Yes, blazing Achilles broke in quickly. What a worthless burnt out cover I will be called. If I will submit to you and all your orders, whatever you blurt out, fling them at others. Don't give me commands. Never again, I trust, will Achilles yield to you. And I tell you this, take it to her. I warn you, my hand will never do battle for that girl, neither with you, king, nor any man alive. You actions gave her. Now you have snatched her back, but all the rest I possess beside my fast black ships. But one bit of it, can you seize my will? At thrice come, try, so the men can see the instant your black blood crush and spurred around my spear. Once the two had fought it out with words, battling face to face, both sprang to their feet and broke up musters beside the aggy squadrons. Achilles strode off to his dreams, shapes and shelter back to his friend Petrolocus, and the comrades Agamemnon had a vessels hauled down to the sea. He picked out twenty oarsmen to man her lock put aboard the cattle for sacrifice to the god and laid her Achilles in all her beauty are my ships. Versatile Odysseus took the helm as a captain or embark party. The party launched out on the sea forming lands while the son of Atreus told his troops to wash while the son of Atreus told his troop to wash purify himself from the filth of plague. They scored it off through soaring in the surf, sacrificed to Apollo, full brown bulls and goats along the beaten shores of the fellow barren sea, savory smokes went swirling up the skies. So the men were engaged throughout the camp, but King Agamemnon would not stop the quarrel. The first So the men were engaged throughout the camp, but the king Agamemnon would not stop the quarrel. First threat he hurled against Achilles. He called Thalithabes and Eribates Brisky, his two heralds ready willing idols. Go to Achilles' lodge. Take her business at once. His beauty be seized by the hands and my bring her here. But if you will not surrender her, I will go myself. I will seize myself with an army at my back and all the worse for him. He sent them off with a strip order ringing in their ear. Against their will, the two men made her way along the baking surf of the barren salt sea and reached the Mambidon's shelters and their ships. They found him beside his lodge and black hull seated grimly and Achilles took no joy. When he saw the two approaching, they were afraid. They held the king in awe and stood there silent. Not a word to Achilles, not a question. But he sensed it all in his heart. Their fear, their charge, 